I'm a scientist, just to introduce myself, so I need PowerPoint. Um, and, uh, uh, but I'm also talking about climate, and therefore I need all the visual aids I can get because people have largely lost interest in climate change. Uh, it very much feels like last decade's issue, but I could be fairly confident that uh, a lot of you here in this room, if you've been in the business of environmental communication for more than a year or so, have probably worked on communicating climate change or the climate change issue at some point in the past, even if you've sort of given up doing that sort of thing now. Um, and, and I think the question we have to ask ourselves is why, as, as uh, Angela pointed out at the beginning, um, this issue is so firmly in reverse as far as public perception of climate is concerned and public understanding of the issue is, despite the enormous amount of effort and investment that's been made over the past decade in uh, communicating this issue and, and, and educating people about what the issue means and so forth. Um, I'm going to try and convince you that, that essentially it is your fault. Sorry about this. Um, but but this, is, this issue has been um, not undersold or oversold. There's a lot of debate about whether it's undersold or oversold, but it's been missold very badly um, over the past decade. Um, and just in case I don't get to the end of my talk, I think the bottom line of what I'm saying, which I normally don't, um, uh, the bottom line of what I'm going to be saying, uh, sorry, that wasn't a prediction of cataclysm. That was just, you know, I tend to <laughs> overrun. Um, one should be very careful as a climate scientist to avoid that alarmism. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the problem is that this uh, has been very much presented as a, an issue of global catastrophe that will affect our grandchildren, um, whereas in fact the issue is substantially more prosaic than that, but no less serious. And that's the, the sort of the, 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 the point I'd like you to, to think about and to, to, to take away and consider. The, 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 the other aspect of mis-selling on the climate question um, is that it's sort of, is that the debate is over whether climate change is happening or not. Okay, so there's been an enormous amount of, of argument over the past decade about, you know, is it true that climate change is happening or is it not? Um, uh, Aubrey Manning mentioned that, you know, whenever you have a... a, a uh, economic debate, you can get prominent economists on both sides of the argument um, talk, talking on, on talk shows um, uh, giving, giving both sides pro and anti-growth. Um, this, you may not have realized this, but this actually never happens or hasn't happened for at least a decade on climate. Yes, you can get Nobel laureates on both sides of the argument, but only one of those Nobel laureates will have actually ever done any research on meteorology or oceanography or climate. Okay? And that Nobel laureate will be, set, will be going along with the consensus view of the way climate is changing. But what we've seen over the past few years is events like this one, the sort of whole climate gate um, email revelations, giving the, popula giving the population at large the impression that um, the whole issue hangs by a thread um, of evidence that a few scientists might have fiddled the data and therefore, un, you know, if, if they're caught out, as it were, undermines the entire um, case for human influence on climate. I, I, I asked for some PowerPoint uh, because uh, I, I think you can't really get this one unless you get the visual, which I've got behind me here. Um, so this is the impact of the whole UEA email affair. And think about the amount of newsprint, the amount of airtime air and so forth, which was devoted to that uh, affair. Um, over the past couple of years. This is the total impact of that affair on any published data set that is of any relevance to the evidence for human influence on climate. And to help those of you at the back who may have um, uh, been missing something, um, that's the correction, okay? It's about two hundredths of a degree in the late 1870s, okay? Now, it's important to get these things right, and we are grateful to the... Uh, uh, the, those who've, who've scoured over the data and identified a problem with input files which resulted in that much small correction in this, in this record, okay? But that's the only change to any published number that's resulted from this entire affair. Now, you wouldn't have got that impression from the way it's been covered in the media. Certainly, the public has not got that impression. They're all under the impression, basically, that it's all up in the air again. We've really no idea what's going on because people have been caught fiddling the numbers. Um, in fact, um, again, another point that I'd want to take issue with, with Aubrey on, he, he mentioned to you that uh, um, the, uh, I think I noted, ec economists' models, they're on a level with the models which are being used to predict climate. I'd like to object very strongly to that statement. Um, it's very, as it happens, 
it's very substantially easier to predict climate than it is to predict the world economy. Um, an illustration of this uh, is shown by this figure here, uh, where I'm showing you uh, how global temperatures have evolved over the satellite era. So it's a surface um, record, that uh, controversial one which uh, people say has been fiddled, um, and the satellite record, which um, um, ske the skeptics are most fond of. That's the one which comes out of... Uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville. Um, and as you can see, they, they, they match each other very well. They show this decadal warming trend. And I've, show, I've just added in gray here the uh, predicted range of warming trends uh, based, made by the IPCC um, in 2000 based on data available to the sort of mid-1990s. So this is a, a genuine prediction by the time you get to the end of this, uh, uh, this series. It's not a matter of fitting data that's already happened in the past. Um, the IPCC, or, or us scientists, so to speak, um, did predict that this decade we've just had would be around two-tenths of a degree warmer than the decade of the 90s, and we were right. Other people predicted it would be either the same temperature or cooler than the 90s, and they were wrong. This is a fact that nobody really gets, okay? But it's a very simple fact. Now, I'm not saying just because we were right in the past, like the usual disclaimer, you know, being right in the past doesn't always guarantee that you're going to be right in the future, but it does indicate that the business of prediction may actually, t may actually not be entirely impossible. And the business of predicting climate, or at least certainly the response of the climate system to rising greenhouse gases, turns out to be actually a lot more straightforward than some of us feared it might be. Oops, there we are, okay. Um, so um, that's the, the point we want to make here is that um, it, it's not, it turns out not to be nearly as difficult a prediction problem to, to what many of us feared it was uh, when, well, around the time, for example, that I started working in this field around 1990. We do understand, uh, there are uncertainties, of course, but we do understand, broadly speaking, what's happening at the global scale. Um, the public doesn't understand that we understand, and hence a lot of the confusion that surrounds this, um, uh, this, this topic at the moment. Um, that doesn't mean we understand everything. It doesn't just because we can predict what's going to happen in the next decade or two doesn't mean we'll always get it right, because, of course, the, a volcano could go off, something else could happen, um, and that will need to be factored into the prediction as it evolves. But broadly speaking, we do understand at the global scale what's going on. It doesn't, it doesn't preclude the possibility of surprises, but you're, you're having to look increasingly into the, the fringes of what's possible in order to work out that this warming trend will suddenly stop um, in the next decade of, of its own accord. However, that's talking about global temperature, which of course has no impact on anybody, um, and um, the kind of thing which people really care about are events like this one. This is uh, a striking image of um, temperatures in Russia in uh, uh, the middle of 2010, July 2010. You can see there's a, a, a location here um, which, where temperatures were uh, 10 to 12 degrees above normal, um, and that's the conditions in Moscow at the time. Uh, I'm, I don't know how many people were killed by this heat wave, but um, crucially, you can see it's, it's a localized phenomenon. It killed a lot of people, but it happened there, you know, over here in Siberia or down, you know, down here in, in, uh, uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, temperatures were cooler than normal. This is the kind of event that people actually notice. My worry is that having messed it up on the global temperature question, we're now in the business of messing it up on the weather event, on understanding the link between weather and climate as well. Um, this is the sort of um, thing which gets said um, about weather and climate. Quote from Al Gore, he's a very public figure, so I feel okay quoting him. Um, but um, you know, he's saying here, they used to say we're changing the odds, loading the dice. Now he says we're painting more dots on the dice. Instead of rolling 12s, we're rolling 13s and 14s, okay? It's a striking image, a bit like a lot of the images of you know, cataclysm that were thrown around uh, in the mid-2000s sort of um, about uh, climate going over a tipping point and, and uh, leading us all into a new ice age or whatever. Um, but it's wrong. We are not seeing weather events that could not have happened in the absence of human influence on climate. What we're seeing is indeed loading the dice. We are seeing weather events being made more likely. That, however, is deemed, and I've been in correspondence, not with Al Gore, because, of course, he doesn't answer emails, but his, the people who advise him on this kind of thing, um, and, and their reaction is, well, the loading dice analogy isn't strong enough. People don't, people don't see that as, as, as a problem. Um, and so, so this is a more striking analogy. Yeah, but it's striking, but it's wrong. That doesn't help, because it's far too easy for somebody then to stand up and say, well, you know, he's got it wrong, therefore you can ignore everything else he's saying. 
So we're walking into exactly the same trap again. Over-egging, well, not overselling the case, but mis-selling the case. Because I wouldn't say that loading dice is necessarily any better or worse than painting more dots on them. You can lose money against somebody playing with a loaded dice just as easily as you can lose money against somebody who's sneakily painted an extra dot onto one of the faces. OK? So just because it concerns probability rather than the actual number of dots doesn't mean it's not bad. OK? So it's back to this mis-selling problem. So simplify. Einstein had a great comment that everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler. Um, and this, this is this has dogged the climate issue from the start. People really want to simplify it down to make it easy to communicate to the public. And they simplify it so far, they just make it wrong. And then it's incredibly easy for anybody who wants to stir the pot a little bit to point out what is wrong um, and, and undermine public confidence in the whole issue. Um, the kind of thing we do um, is looking, this is my sort of little techie slide, um, is, is indeed looking at how the dice have been loaded towards um, heat waves of this nature becoming more likely. And we do indeed see something like a fourfold increase in risk of a heat wave of the magnitude of what occurred in, in, uh, uh, in Russia in the, since, since the 1960s. And a substantial fraction of that increase in risk is likely to be due to the increase in greenhouse gases. That is not an insignificant change. That is a very important change. Okay? But people have to understand it. There's no point in simplifying it down beyond what is actually supported by the science. And that's the problem we face here. So the, the real challenge I want to put out to you as communicators is you know, maybe the fact we've got to the point um, so, you know, that climate science is, you know, the sort of stuff I do is becoming increasingly uninteresting to you. It's becoming quite technical. It concerns how climate is affecting weather in various parts of the world. Um, it's, it's, to, it's concerned with you know, the, how the odds on specific weather events are changing. The sort of big picture questions that got everybody so juiced up in the last decade, whether the climate was changing at all, why it was changing, what we need to do about it, they, they, they're not evolving. The, the answers to those questions are not evolving. They, they, there's, there's not much happening on those questions anymore. So the sort of whole process of what we might call rather rudely climate infotainment, um, which was a big feature of the BBC um, a couple of years ago, um, is, is, is dead. I mean, there's, there's, there's no point in running um, sort of repeated climate um, uh, scare stories in the media because people have just lost interest in it. Um, professional cl climate communicators are likewise dying out. This is, not, this is no longer an issue. So because climate change has become boring. But the question we've got to ask ourselves is, I don't know, maybe that's a good thing because maybe the idea of selling this as something that people were going to deal with um, as a great collective action um, uh, uh, enterprise um, was, was never going to work. And that actually, the way it's going, the whole climate change issue will be played out by professionals largely leaving the public out of the picture. That's sad for democracy, but it may ultimately be the best for the planet. <laughs>